You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Welcome to a new series of Welding with Berlin-based artist Eula Flierl. Eula works with choreography and the voice, and I'm particularly excited about her research into sound dances and this idea that the voice itself is dancing, which is a beautiful proposition. So thanks so much, Eula, for coming on to the show today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I wondered, Yula, to begin, if you could tell us some impressions about the current world that you're recording from at the moment. So I am in a room. Um, in front of me is a window and outside is an edeka. And this edeka is very loud from six o'clock uh, in the morning. Uh, but I feel always really connected to looking outside and to seeing the people pass by with their masks. And the interesting thing about this room is actually that I work here, I hang out here, um, I sleep here, and last weekend it was also my stage, it was my backstage. Yeah, I did an online lecture performance for How For, and uh, I made my whole light design on my table, and I had a microphone but then I didn't use it so I, I made a whole mise-en-scene basically uh, about my background what will people see um, but actually I was wrapped in my woolen blanket like right now also but people wouldn't see that because they would only see my portrait so this function of the home office because I'm a performer who does recently kind of a lot of online appearances um, this is also my theater you know so um, this is a very particular moment where um, this private space becomes connected to the world through these online performances I'm very amused by by this actually and I'm trying yeah I'm trying out a lot of different things ah that's beautiful <laughs> Also, I find working online that it kind of opens you up to the other world through the portal of the screen. So it is very interchangeable in that way, the way your presence is at the moment, um, even through our conversation, actually, with me being in a another location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how sometimes these world also mix like which kind of work do I do production work am I performing I'm sitting on the same chair for this but also when I'm hanging out and I watch a series I'm sitting again on the same chair in front of the same desk and um, I try at the moment to have different functions in different corners of the room. So I experience that I'm in different places with different activities. Um, because I also uh, write uh, personal letters and messages to people from exactly the same device on the same table, sitting in the same chair, being wrapped in the same woolen blanket. So uh, that is basically, it's like... Um, over layering of different functions in the same space also because of my uh, uh, my computer that gives me again access to many different worlds I try to have it less and less hermetic but it always pulls me in into the axis of this very chair in front of this desk <laughs> mm. yeah absolutely I'm also sitting at a desk at the moment And I have a few plants around me and a microphone in front of me, which is very interesting because I find the microphone also draws my attention very much to become quite focused, actually, in quite a small area. Um, so I think that's part of 
this welding practice, which is so great to uh, explore a little bit together today, is also how can we expand our attention to what's surrounding us and be really aware of this reciprocal relationship for Mm -hmm. perhaps the plant or the person listening to this podcast where we're also a podcast companion in the background perhaps of you know riding a bicycle or cooking a meal Mm -hmm. so I think these lines of interconnection are very interesting if you can kind of expand your awareness from the thing you're focused on to the little things that are informing uh, the decisions you make Yeah, I actually love that interest because the functionality of the action takes over super quickly. But I do gain a lot of pleasure to wonder about this green lamp in front of me that has a very beautiful grass green and how the light is reflecting in uh, the metal or about uh, the lemon juice in front of me, lemon soda, um, in an orange glass, uh, by focusing on these um, material objects, um, these uh, more sensual impressions of the room. I, um, yeah, I'm very happy for this invitation because I I realize how the functions are taking over, especially with the computer so much. Yeah, it's a very special time, I think, to be thinking of welding, especially as the is so much talk about the local like I feel also I'm traversing less space like I don't go now to a dance studio so often because a lot of projects get moved online and I'm rarely on my bicycle even like the distances become Mm -hmm. shorter and so Mm -hmm. the input um, the physical input reduces but as you say this interconnection online is um, so so present and so demanding somehow like I Mm. I love it and I'm consuming it and smothering myself in it but I also feel quite intimidated by uh, by its presence and how connected I'm becoming Mm -hmm. yeah there's a different worlding going on I think in connection to the online space or in connection to the physical space this is very interesting how they are like absolutely connected but somehow the logics or the way how time flows is really different I feel Mm. yeah I think that links really nicely actually also when you mention time just to pick up on that thread of weaving things back and forward because I think also online does that a lot you know somebody will write an email and you'll receive it Uh, perhaps a few days later or um, you put things into the world that are picked up at different points perhaps this podcast is also picked up after we've recorded it and um, I actually was really drawn to your choreographic practice because in 2019 I saw Stroll Out the piece you made in relation to Valeska Gerd the German grotesque performer from the 1920s And I felt her presence actually in that piece so strongly. And I wondered if you could talk about that idea of time and worlding in relation to how you make choreographic work and dance for stage. Yes. Yeah, I will maybe start to speak about how I wanted to create a relationship with Valeska Gerd, who died in 1978 and uh, before my birth even, you know. And then I was reading a lot of her texts, her manifestos. I was listening to her. Um, She wrote four autobiographies, so she really talks a lot. uh, Like there's a lot of uh, access to how she talks about herself. And, And it was very challenging for me to understand how can we have a dialogue here. And she's um, super critical towards many, many um, uh, developments in dance and in the world. And her way of thinking was something that I really wanted to get in touch to. And, um, and so I wanted to get in touch with, with her um, mindset 
or a spirit or something like this and let it really um, influence my way of working also. So what happens then in the piece that also for me, it's never clear if I'm now Jule talking to Valeska, if Valeska is talking to the audience or to me, or if I'm talking about her to the audience. So these layers, because it's a solo performance, they are, I was really interested in having many voices possible coming out of my body, but never clarifying. So which one is it right now? Um, that is really important for me. And I imagined my fictional, uh, let's say, approach. No, it's not fictional. My practical, methodological uh, approach to time or history in this uh, piece is based on a fictional thought, which is that we are all swimming in a pool together. We are there together in a more chaotic, non-organized way. But um, I wanted that um, uh, uh, this uh, chronological, historic uh, uh, timing basically would not dominate my thinking like, and now she's dead and it's old and now I'm in a contemporary moment. I was more interested in how can we meet here in this space together, even though... Um, um, The works that I was uh, uh, reinterpreting are from the end of the 20s mainly. So choreographically, I made the space into like a cartography of her work and different places had different functions in the room. And I wanted that this thing can exist next to each other, almost like in an exhibition where you go from piece to piece and I'm just activating them by going there but they are constantly present and the audience is in the situation, is in the work, is part of it. They interact with it, they love, they can disturb it, they can uh, uh, be present with the work. And I uh, wanted that there is a presence of the historic works, but also of the work that I'm doing in relationship to them where they appear, like they appear in the here and now, but the presence is much broader than only this life moment. So for me, I came to a really big interest in trying to understand how the life moment can be not only in the here and now, but how the life moment can be a bridge, basically. You know, whose function is that we are here to meet and to experience something together, but that we can bridge different uh, 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 times mm. to not have this maybe very fixed belief in that the contemporary moment is only now. Yeah, absolutely. That is something I would question. Yeah. Mm. Or I, in this work, especially. Yeah. No, I love that. I think it's also a very strong proposition to extend worlding, to actually begin to build companionship with people and things that are not present and having experienced stroll out as an audience member it's also nice for listeners to know that we're seated around the space on different um, forms of rostra so seating banks and Eula's moving between us with this red lipstick on her face and totally embodied I remember your presence especially energetically was very strong And I did have that feeling being an audience member, even though it was a few years ago now, of very much having these voices in this space, but also their presence through your embodiment. So I did have that feeling of time coming together and that the past, as I understand it from a Western point of view, is being behind me and something that's already happened coming forward to where we are now. So I totally felt that you achieved that uh, in that work. And maybe the voice is also a really interesting medium relating to time because I can believe this is my voice. This is uniquely my individual voice. But I can also say that I am always in relation through my voice my voice is a medium of creating relationship 
it is uh, inherited medium, but also um, voices speak through me. Um, um, there are many uh, uh, practices, basically, that are also about disidentifying with your voice and really uh, uh, going into more um, uh, imaginary of this voice is a, a medium of channeling other voices. And that, for me, is super interesting on a, a, a speech level, on a musical level. Um, and and uh, like this, I, it's basically a medium with which I can let the world pass through me. Because mm. continuing, so the voice comes through you. So this is very much like um, a human perspective. And then with the idea of, worlding and this focus also on the more than human so the presence and the surrounding as a intermingling if you like of uh, the human experience in relation to its surroundings and different layers that are happening at the same time would you say that like through your work on the voice it's informed also your listening in that way of the reciprocal relation do you hear things differently perhaps if we go back to your room um yeah do you notice perhaps I can imagine like in your lemon juice um do you do you hear the liquid in a different way like can you talk a little bit about that how working on the internal has also perhaps expanded the way you perceive the external interesting Yes, I think that this whole um, obsession with how is the voice dance, how does it change our relationship to the body if we consider it as an essential uh, uh, member of dance, um, it brings us directly to listening. Listening is almost the thing that needs to happen before uh, vocalizing before singing before any activity with the voice um, and uh, uh, choreographically it's a task for me to understand so how can I not only choreograph for the eyes of the audience which are at the front of the face and lead you into what is in, in front of you but how can I choreograph for the ears of the audience too that can also perceive what's behind them, what's around them, what's surrounding them. And that sense, the ears are an organ that are much more um, um, bringing you in, uh, in a more immersive perception of uh, your surrounding, which I guess it's more in relationship to the reality of the world, that it's everywhere, not just in front of us. Mm. And um, because we are uh, uh, in a, uh, society that is very image based, um, even though also now uh, very manipulative uh, technologies that work with sound are um, developed and applied and so on. Yeah, for me to choreograph dance that maybe focuses on ears is very interesting. It should still be dance. Like, how can I say it's not theater, it's not music, but. Um, the world enters into us through uh, the ears also. And not only, and then listening can become a, a synesthetic metaphor for all other senses. No, I can listen with my hands. I can listen with my eyes. How can I see as a way of listening? How does that change my relationship to what I perceive through my eyes? And... Um, yeah, and I would say that um, that this internal, external also dissolves the binary, either or dissolves in listening. Absolutely. Um, because it's more like a feedback loop. It's more like a very porous uh, um, exchange. Um, um, and then the internal becomes external, uh, becomes like the external concerns me because it's also in internal. Yeah, so I, I feel like for me personally, it's really a task. It's a challenge for how can I exist differently in the world? Um, 
yeah, and that that is a very dense thinking, you know. But I can expand it to uh, uh, other practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also continuing that thought, it's also a practice in curiosity because with this dissolving of um, these binaries, I also get the feeling like uh, thinking through what you're saying of the voice and the listening and this um, almost like an infinitude loop, actually. I recently put the infinitude loop together as a 3D model. So I made a, a string and um, you have to twist one side to connect it to the other side. I, I think everyone knows mm -hmm. this Lemiscuit symbol, this figure eight that um, represents infinity, mm -hmm. but it literally twists. So if you have one side of the paper colored, I did it with yellow highlighter actually, and the yellow highlighted side goes on the outside and then twists round to come back in the inside. And I know you're mm -hmm. also um, co-curating and founding a series at the moment called From Breath to Matter. And I think that's also a very interesting place that your practice is taking you from working with voice to now so um, publicly, I guess, directing your practice towards breath. Yeah, breath is basically, breath now since uh, 2020, breath maybe has changed also in its perception uh, uh, of what it is. Many people know more what aerosols are now and we are uh, uh, having um, huge desire to, uh, to, you know, some people feel suffocated from the mask. Other people make very conscious decision. Okay, this is here where I'm breathing and then not again. At the same time, it became super politicized through the sentence, I can't breathe also. That has been uh, uh, repeated. There's graffitis. Uh, it's, it's this like emblematic phrase from George Floyd and from many people before him, Afro-Americans who got killed from the police in the U.S., it represents something. So we are like 2020 is this year where breath has become like from many different perspectives, a super politicized uh, thing. Um, and, and, and I think it's really valuable and worth it to think about it. Breath, of course, as a carrier of voice also, but also as a sign of life, very simply. <laughs> um, I have done uh, several online lecture performances about breathing because I wanted to find out something about how can we come back into a sensual relationship with breathing and not only mechanical or fear ridden now with the um, whole um, uh, insecurity about how the uh, virus is transmitted and so on. So um, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me how if I change the narrative of what breathing is, then breathing also in my body anatomically on a somatic level is organized differently, depending on what story I'm telling about it. And uh, that is very beautiful how even uh, these uh, physical anatomical things are also fictions, are almost like ideologies. And you can see how they change throughout history, how it was the industrial palace uh, uh, was a metaphor for the body in the 20s. And now we rather use uh, computer metaphors for how the body is working, also because we're more interested in the nervous system. So that is something I really... Uh, 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 dealt with also because how I am with the world, with this porosity, um, is really uh, different. If I give attention to my breathing and to the world entering and exiting my body also through breathing. And, um, and uh, the series From Breath to Matter, um, we're doing it since more than four years, first with Alessio Castellacci and since uh, more than two years with Mikayashi Ebison. And um, for us, it's interesting, this process from breath and then to matter, and then how does it become matter? And, and, and that is really interesting for us, you know, like breathing as a, as a basis, and then what does it become? What matter? Does it become speech? Does it become 
sound? Does it become a breath choreography? Uh, does it become silence? Does it become a shared breath? And, and, and all of this title that we had uh, long before the Corona crisis um, now becomes super politicized. Uh, and um, it is uh, great to continue thinking about the new meaning of the title of our series also. Yeah, I think it's a lovely, very holistic approach with the listening and voicing and breathing because they're things that are very porous and that word dissolving comes up again of oscillating kind of between them. And um, it's very interesting that actually we segregate them quite often. And so I think that's a, a nice way also bringing it back to welding of expanding outwards and seeing things in this holistic interchange, if that makes sense, rather than separating things and creating these binaries. So I think that's, that's very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I wondered to create an experience that listeners could embody your practice. Um, so is there a way that you could share with us uh, how you physicalize these ideas that you're swimming in in the pool? Well, there are two things, and I think I would maybe take the first, the one that is a bit more direct. I also use that in the lecture performances I'm doing. So we are now listening to a podcast. Most probably you listen to it on your telephone, and maybe you can move around. So um, maybe, Renee, you can also do it and I will talk you through. Fabulous. Please get an object that you think smells really great, something that you enjoy. Um, you can go through your flat. Um, is it an essential oil? Is it um, flower? Is it the earth? Uh, under your flower that your flower is in or do you just want to open the window get in contact with that object you can have your nose in a in a distance where you can sense it it doesn't have to be super strong and just observe how um, the smell of that um, object um, touches you, how the soft tissue in your nose and the receptors are being stimulated by that smell, how far deep into your head uh, can you perceive that smell and if you Exhale also. Is the smell still present in your exhalation or only in your inhalation? Is there maybe an emotional layer to that smell? Memory, association, um, what does the smell do to your whole breathing? process, so also to your lungs, to your diaphragm, maybe to the texture that you feel in your throat. Yes, okay. So we go to another step and please go and find an object near you whose smell is really uncomfortable. So I have, for example, glue here. Glue, you know, that has also this kind of smell that is uncomfortable. You can also go to your bio trash. <laughs> you can go... Um, um, yeah, to a cleaning uh, object... So we will do a similar thing now, but we don't do it as long. 
But what we're interested in with the smell is how does it change your breathing? How does it touch you? And what, uh, uh, how does the sensation produce a different body? So let's open the object and just take a moment to breathe, to inhale and exhale. Again, the question, is the smell also present in the exhalation? How does your body change? The whole change of chain of breathing, breathing until the um, diaphragm. And let's stop it. Depending on the object you have just uh, taken, that might have been very uncomfortable. So... Um, That's another way of breathing. And now let's go to the third and last object. So take something uh, that is edible. Maybe something that you like. Something uh, that really turns you on in terms of taste. A uh, cake, a banana, a uh, sausage, <laughs> um, cheese. Yeah? Take something uh, that uh, you like, open it, and see how the touch of that of that uh, smell in your nose, how does your soft tissue respond? What's the response of your body? Maybe your mouth is watering a bit. Is there maybe a desire to breathe? Um, a desire to come in contact? How does it feel to not eat and to only smell? After the podcast, you may eat. But now, like, try to keep this... Um, suspense moment I don't eat yet I smell and I see what the presence of this object um, how it changes my body how it changes the process of breathing and what I associate with the presence of this object You had three different objects, three different modes of breathing that were informed by different smells. So this proposal, if we finish this exercise now, is about um, the desire that I have in this corona crisis also to bring breathing back into a realm where it becomes a sensorial tool for us to be in touch with the world and maybe to be a very concrete instrument for worlding. Oh... That's the exercise. Yeah, <laughs> my body is shivering. Yeah, nice. What a That's generous <laughs> offering. Um, am I able to share my three objects? Please <laughs> do that. Yes. <laughs> This podcast is, is a little bit on the longer side, but I just wanted to, yeah, I had first my lip balm and I have a Burt Bees menthol lip balm. Uh, was my first object. And so there was something very luxurious about it, but also tingling because menthol, you know, when you inhale it, it also expands the sinuses. So I felt mm -hmm. very full and moving outwards. And then my second object was my keys. And they're not so nice at the moment because I attach my bike down 
um, always kind of to the bike rack and there's a bit of rubbish on the ground. So it kind of had some remnants of, I don't know, Mm -hmm. there's rats there. So maybe there's some rat droppings and it felt very, um, yeah, gritty, like really the dirt. And I, I felt this also inside, you know, a lot of things inside my body are dying and being let go of. And, um, I really felt this kind of, you know, you're talking about this porousness of the inside and the outside. I thought, oh, wow, I might also go to the bathroom soon and part of my insides will go out, you know. It was very, very much Mm -hmm. this channel. Um, And then I went to an after eight dinner mint. (laughs) So it was a nice um, balancing, I would say, for the the keys. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super. Yeah, I'm curious what listeners also um, collected in their objects. There is a way actually at reneeshadler.com slash worlding that people uh, can leave some comments. So it would be lovely to share what listeners collected with their objects and um, continue this conversation because it's very rich research, Eula, and it's been such a pleasure to speak with you about your practice and thank you so much for collaborating and being a part of the Worlding podcast project. Thank you. It's a very nice occasion to talk about uh, what I'm always dealing with, but through this lens of Worlding, it's a very beautiful Mm, invitation. Thank Thank you. you. And also as the first interviewee of Worlding for this string, um, you've recommended a second person who's influenced you and is a part of your world at the moment. Could you announce um, for the listeners who that person would be and why you've um, found them Mm -hmm. important for your world at the moment? So I am in a regular phone contact with Wasi Mears Clark. It's one of the most pleasurable persons to talk to, uh, even though he doesn't live in Berlin anymore, still in Germany, but we are uh, telephoning and I'm always super amazed about uh, uh, really thinking together. Uh, Zwasi is a choreographer who has dealt also with eliminating the uh, visual sense um, in a piece that uh, played completely in the darkness. His thinking really uh, uh, connects in always very surprising ways for me Uh, a political activism with a search for uh, uh, what is the social encounter in uh, performance. And I am always very excited and curious about what he's doing next. And uh, I am sure you're going to enjoy the conversation with Swasi. (laughs) Thank you so much, Yola. We're yes. looking forward to speaking with Zwozi and thank you for this beautiful encounter. I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. You too and to everybody who's listening. Thank you for listening to the Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.